So in your opinion, because we've discussed this numerous times on our show, we'll start with the JFK one for you, because that's when you got started. Um, uh, what was your personal belief? Um, do you th do you think it was Oswald himself? Was there somebody on the grassy knoll? Do you believe in any of that? Uh, and if not, uh, who did it? Um, our personal belief on the show is that Oswald yeah. did do it. There wasn't well, a person yeah. on the grassy knoll. Um, but I'm sure you look, you got, you got to see all the ins and outs of it. Uh, yeah. obviously. Well, so. gentlemen, um, I, uh, yeah, well, we, so we shall respectfully disagree with each other. Um, really? whether Oswald, whether Oswald was a shooter or not, uh, fine. I, I don't even have to get into that. It's all I have to do is prove that there was a second shooter. Right. And that is a conspiracy. And under the laws of 50 states and the federal government, two or more people involved in the planning, execution, uh, covering up thereafter of any kind of a crime makes it a conspiracy right okay so let's talk about this you have um to begin with the doctors at parkland hospital working on the president one of them uh, dr robert mcclellan whom i had the pleasure of meeting and talking with personally and go and yourselves and see his interview at the sixth floor museum dallas and see what he has to say that he and the other doctors about what they saw in the president's head McClellan was holding the retractor for 18 minutes, staring right into the brain. Right, Dr. Right. Kemp Clark, who was the chairman of the Department of Neurosurgery, he was there. What they saw, they beep, saw beep. damage to the back of the president's brain. Mm -hmm. They saw a piece of the cerebellum, which is located in the rear inferiorly of the cranial wall. They saw a piece of it actually fall out uh, and so on. Okay, so to begin with, then the medical examiner, Dr. Earl Rose, a board certified forensic pathologist whom I had come to know when I was in the Air Force. It was there to take control. He was the medical examiner of Dallas. They pushed him aside. They threatened him and they took the body of the president and went to Washington, D.C. OK, as a matter of fact, although uh, it wasn't planned, that really should have been to their advantage because it gave them time to bring together the foremost forensic pathologists in the country to do this autopsy. Keep in mind, gentlemen, multiple gunshot wounds you have to determine entrance and exit, right. angle, trajectory, sequence. And then you have to correlate those wounds in Kennedy with the wounds in Connolly. You realize what a formidable task this is? I mean, my God, I, I can't even be horrendous. Anytime I have a case, somebody has been shot multiple times. It's a very difficult task. I've done this many times, like the Diallo the case, the African gentleman who was shot and killed in Washington, in, in New York City uh, by the cops, uh, fired 17 times. Mm -hmm. I had to... Uh, do a second autopsy on him. Okay, so to do this autopsy, so for you guys mm -hmm. and all your listeners who mm -hmm. continue to believe the work this report, you have to begin with the evidentiary burden of answering to me and to the American public, how is it for that case of the president of the United States of America shot down in broad daylight in the fourth largest city of the country with all of those things to be ascertained that we're going to call upon two career military naval pathologists, Humes and Boswell at Bethesda Naval Center, to do this autopsy, who had never done a single gunshot wound autopsy in their entire careers. Does that give you pause? Yes. I mean, it, it's a, that, what that tells me is they brought in a guy that would do what they said. You bet right. your ass, baby. That's exactly what it was. And by the you way, the round used to kill JFK was a 6.5, uh, uh, basically not like a Creedmoor, but it's, it's basically- Copper jacket, yeah. lead core ammunition. I want to talk about that too. It's not a very, common, it's not a very common round. Mm -hmm. No. Right. The Manica Carcano, you probably know more about that yeah. than I do. But I've talked with long gun experts here. We have a lot of hunters and shooters in Pennsylvania. Um, everybody agrees. It's the most inferior weapon of his genre developed anywhere in the world. Nobody laughs at it more than the Italians. I gave this program at the Institute of Legal Medicine in Rome, and the professors there were laughing. I was embarrassed. I thought they were laughing at me. I find out later from the director with whom I had become good friends, and he spoke English. He said to me, uh, Silvio Marley, he said, no, no, they're not laughing at you. They're laughing when you talked about the manager of Carcano. In Italy, the manager of Carcano is considered to be an instrument of love not a weapon of war. Uh, so <laughs> so are, that, you, are you saying that there's mul there was multiple shooters in the JFK there was, shooting? There was, there was a, a shooter from behind the picket fence on the grassy knoll. And then you get in down to the head wounds um, and the radiographic, the neurological, the neurosurgical, the acoustical evidence. Everything fits in exactly. 
And right. we've done extensive work. Uh, many, many of my colleagues in research have gone over. And remember this then too, you say you continue to believe, you have to buy the single bullet theory because the single bullet theory is the sine qua non of the Warren Commission report's conclusion vis-a-vis -vis Oswald as a sole assassin. Without right. the single bullet theory, there could not be such a conclusion. The single bullet theory has one bullet going into Kennedy's back, moving upward 11 and a half degrees, having been fired from the sixth floor window, moving downward, it comes into the back, it moves up 11 and a half degrees, exits from the front of his neck, comes right. out, moving to the left and downward. Here's Connolly sitting directly in front of the president. The bullet turns in midair, comes over, hits Connolly behind the right armpit, not the left shoulder, not the left armpit, behind the right armpit, goes into the chest, pierces the right lung, destroys four inches of the right fifth rib, exits below nipple level. Look at the Zapruder film. Connolly's holding that white Stetson hat, waving to the crowd like this. The hat is at shoulder level. The bullet emerging downward below nipple level, comes out and comes up and around and goes into the back of his wrist, produces a comminuted fracture of the radius, one of the two long bones from the elbow to the wrist, a large bone, especially in a six foot four big bone Texan like Connolly, exits from the front of his wrist, goes down into the left thigh and somehow works his way out of the left thigh onto the stretcher to be found fortuitously by a maintenance man trying to get to the men's room after the presidential entourage had left and finding a bullet on near beneath the stretcher that nobody else had seen, a 6.5 millimeter bullet. A bullet right. with a copper jacket entirely intact, no deformity at the nose, the cone, the jacket of the bullet, none at all, weighing 158.6 grains from its original weight of 161 grains, a loss of 1.5 grains, despite having enough pieces of itself in four anatomic locations of Kennedy and Connolly. And that is the single bullet theory. So you accept the Warren Commission report vis-a-vis -vis Oswald? No, you, no, 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 I don't accept the Warren Commission report. I just know personally, if I was in that location, even with that weapon, I could take four or five shots in that amount of time that he took, three shots, or at least the theory that he took three shots. I know that I could, uh, put, you're, I you're could easily put rounds accurately on that target from that location without any problem at all. That's, that's oh. my thinking behind it. Now, there's, there's another addition to all this that we haven't brought up yet. Um, and it's that all this stuff that was looked at through the brain and blah, 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 even if you accept all these things mm -hmm. and, as coincidence or whatever, where his brain is missing now. You guys know uh, that, right? Yeah. I mean, you, you obviously know. I that. pointed You know that his out. brain has been missing for years. Yeah. Like, 1970. <laughs> okay. I'm yeah, sure. no, go no, ahead. No, go ahead. What, go what, ahead. What, do you know where it's at? That, that's where we're, we were no, going with this. I want to tell you that I finally it as the first non-government sponsored, non-government related, forensic pathologist given access to all of the autopsy materials. It took quite a time to get in and do that. And that's a whole story in and of itself. I won't take the time. So anyway, I get in there in August of 1972. And there I'm looking at these agreements from Jack and Kennedy about all of this stuff being her personal property and she's giving it to the government as a gift. And then the proviso that nobody could see this stuff for 75 years, with the exception that after five years, a uh, um, recognized expert in the field of pathology a serious historic purpose could apply. So finally, I got in, and there I found that the box containing the brain, mm -hmm. uh, the large metal box, was no longer listed in the final inventory of October 66 and missing. And I reported that. Look it up, August 24, Sunday edition, page one, New York Times, Fred Graham, top investigative reporter, president's brain missing. To this <laughs> day, as we sit here, some uh, uh, 72, that's uh, 28 and 20, is 48 years, 48 years later, nobody has accounted for the brain. The brain is missing. And, and you know what? To show you the way in which this was conspiratorially contrived and covered up, there were several people who knew that the brain was missing, including top forensic pathologists and other scientists, other medical people. My old chief, where I trained in Baltimore, Russell Fisher was a member of what is referred to as the Ramsey Clark panel that the Attorney General Ramsey Clark convened in 1968 to review the Warren Commission report's findings. Russell Fisher and the forensic neuropathologist from that office, Richard Lindenberg, um, with whom I studied brain pathology. Not one of them ever had a sense of ethics, of morality, of honesty, of objectivity, uh, of independence to comment at that time that the brain was missing. They simply put the stamp of approval on the Warren Commission. There's no way in the world 
And furthermore, let me tell you something. If that were to happen in the Jones or the Smith murder case, in your jurisdiction where you are, mm -hmm. where I am, and the brain was key to the defense's contention that there was a second shooter and so on, and it had to be proved by examining the brain, and the brain was no longer missing, the prosecution somehow along the way, whether deliberately, negligently, yeah. that's called spoliation of evidence. That case is out the window. Yeah. The yeah. judge throws it out. You cannot continue with that case, gentlemen. You don't have the brain. The defendant is not able to conduct his fair defense. So there you have it uh, on the single bullet theory, on the missing brain, and on the sole assassin theory. So I'm so I'm sorry. I no, I I, I definitely it. think. Well, frankly, my belief is that the CIA killed JFK. I think that it. Uh, you got it. Uh, you got it. Because of the Bay of Pigs, probably, but there could be more and, and complicating. Others. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Voting but, rights, civil rights that he's talking about, right. the Vietnam War, the, the Cold mob. War they fought with Russia. You bet your life. There's yep. no way they were going to sit back for five more years of John Kennedy, followed by eight years of Bobby Kennedy. They saw America going to hell in a basket. There's only one way. You weren't going to defeat Kennedy at the polls. There's right. only one way. you got to eliminate him, man. And that's called assassination. And that's called coup d'etat in America. It was the overthrow of the government. That's what it was. Now, if it's a coup d'etat, do you believe, because I've, I've heard a lot of people express that LBJ may have been involved or at least in the know or was told later about that, because he did kind of seamlessly go in and do all the things that uh, uh, JFK was going to do anyways. I mean, this, the, uh, what, let's see, uh, three years into, I, or two years into his term. Uh, uh, the Civil Rights Act got passed and blah, 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 right? I mean, a lot of stuff still happened. We, we continued to escalate in Vietnam, and a lot of stuff happened there. Do you think he was involved at all? I personally do not. Some of my fellow Warren Commission critic researchers believe that he was. I personally do not believe that LBJ was involved. However, I do believe that LBJ found out damn quick what had gone on, uh, and he, he never really believed it. And two of the good old boy uh, senators who knew something about guns who were on the Warren Commission, uh, Senator Richard Russell from Georgia and uh, and uh, Russell um, Russell from Georgia and the uh, Boggs from from Louisiana, they never really bought it. Uh, they just signed on. Right. Uh, uh, that's that was that's the way it was. They're going to cover up. You know, the king is dead. Long live the king. Mm -hmm. You guys would know more about this than I. Don't you think that within minutes? We'll give them an hour following the assassination that by wire and direct phone and through the ambassadors in Beijing and Moscow and Havana, that uh, the inquiry was made damn soon to all of the top people there. Did you guys have anything to do with the assassination of our president? Tell us because our finger is on that nuclear button right. and there's not going to be any Beijing or Moscow or Havana in a matter of minutes if you were. They found out. In a matter of minutes, within the hour, that it wasn't the Russians, it wasn't the Cubans, it wasn't the Chinese. It was us. We have met the enemy, and he is us. And right. that began the cover-up. We're going to have a revolution in America. We're going to bring them back. It's all over. What are you going to do? And they moved on. That's yeah. what it was called. Yeah, yeah. I look. I, I agree with all of that. Um, uh, I'll leave it to folks like you who are smarter than me uh, well, to, yeah. to determine whether or not there was a, another shooter uh, on the grass. You know, I love it. I love the theory, and I like conspiracies. So I'm all in for it, and uh, and I'll let that live on.